Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Sorry we started a few minutes late, um, but welcome. Um, my talk is Solving the Mystery Using the Wizard of Oz Method, or how we found an inexpensive, highly actionable, and ecological way to gather players' feedback early. I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Lainey Dixon. Uh, I am a user research analyst at Ubisoft Montreal. I work on the Rainbow Six Siege. Prior to my time at Ubisoft, I was the co-founder and director of user research at Octothorpe Games. Um, some of the projects actually that I worked on with Octothorpe are, is what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm sorry if you were coming hoping to hear things about Ubisoft. Um, but we're going to be talking about some indie work that I did with my studio. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about our team. So we're an independent studio based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, as you can see, we're a very small team of five. Uh, we're, we're a little bit different as far as indie teams goes because we actually have myself, uh, which is a dedicated embedded user researcher in this team of five. So we hadn't heard of a lot of indie teams or smaller teams like ours um, that had this. So we were really uh, interested in integrating some of the processes and things we knew that larger studios were doing and seeing if we could scale that down to a team of five and what that could look like. Our team was really brought together from a lot of different areas and experiences. Um, we had some tabletop experience, Xer games, art and serious games. And we were really brought together by our varied backgrounds coming into when we created our studio. Uh, we really like pushing ourselves in the types of experiences we create. So we've done a lot of educational games um, and some of the games that you see up here. So one of these really interesting experiences that we started last year uh, was the project called The Irregular. Um, it's an episodic mystery game set in the Sherlock Holmes universe. So we had, since it's episodic, we had some episodes we intended to be designed as a single player game, while other episodes were going to be focused more on multiplayer. So in the first episode, players are investigating clues uh, that have been left at Sherlock's desk to answer a set of questions to solve the watermelon mystery. But how did we get to this point? We've jumped all the way to the end. So let's talk a little bit about how actually the idea for the irregular started. As a team of passionate Sherlock fans, uh, we wanted to create a mystery game that was somewhere between adventure game, puzzle, and point and click games. Uh, but something that was very mentally challenging and focused on exercising deductive reasoning and logic uh, that we felt like was missing in a lot of the current Sherlock Holmes games that we've played. We're really inspired by different logic and visual puzzles, um, including The Vanishing of Ethan Carter and the board game Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. So what we really liked about these games is they create a really interesting understanding of obtuse situations through different visual clues as well as kind of contextual information. So with this inspiration, we spent a few months kind of thinking about what we wanted to do. And ultimately, the end goal was we really wanted to create the Dark Souls of Sherlock Holmes <laughs> Mystery Games. <laughs> so keeping this in mind, uh, we kind of had our beginning idea, what we wanted. We played a lot of games. So it was time to sit down and think about, OK, how do we actually do this? <laughs> So we knew what the goal was. Uh, we wanted the Dark Souls of Mystery wow. Games. And, but we needed to establish some of the challenges that we may encounter. Mystery Games was something that was completely new for all of us. And so we didn't really know how to approach this best, um, being able to be very lean while we were going through this process. So in the early concepting phases, we recognized kind of three high-level challenges that we knew that we would need to focus on and remember kind of throughout the development. So first, we knew that we wanted to maximize what limited time we did have to run and test as much as possible as early in design as possible. And being our first foray into mystery game design, uh, we, we wanted to get creative about how we could test, but also iterate inexpensively and be as efficient in that process as possible. We also wanted to be ecological. And when I say ecological, I mean this from a design, e ecological design perspective. We wanted to try and create something that would mimic the best, the end experience that players would be having in the real world. And we wanted to be mindful of our methods and the way that we actually built out our prototypes to see if we could maximize kind of what those interactions were looking like. 
I recognize that these challenges are not specific to us. <laughs> Many of these challenges you might feel like are very similar to you, and that's okay. We realized that this was just something that we wanted to keep in mind. We had a limited time of only a few months to get a playable demo. So we wanted to really think about at each stage of testing, kind of how we could address these different challenges. So keeping in mind these challenges, we started to kind of create what the first design and prototype for the game was going to be and start thinking about just actually how we were going to test this. The first thing that came to my mind that was always really hard for me to kind of wrap my head around was how do you actually test something when it's supposed to be potentially misleading and confusing? This was something that's pretty inherent for mysteries and so we kind of had to think about what does that mean for our game and how can we actually check for understanding of certain things? So from our own experience with solving mysteries as well as our intended goals for the game, we knew that we wanted something that was largely focused on deductive reasoning, which is largely an internal process. So this led us to two key questions. How do we actually get into the player's head to find out how they're solving the mystery? And how can we actually check for understanding? How can we ensure that the pieces of the game that we want players to understand are understood, as well as they're not going down the wrong path and getting stuck there for too long? So since mysteries kind of inherently fall into this gray area of confusion, our primary focus is we really need to, to verify unintended confusion. So okay. <laughs> we've established our high level challenges and the questions, and now it's really time to sit and think about how do we actually do this test? And for us, it made a lot of sense to start with paper prototyping. Thankfully, the lead designer from our team had significant experience with paper prototyping from his tabletop time and had brought that back to our team and this was a method that we regularly employed, but we didn't actually do a lot of rigorous testing with paper prototypes. So this was something that was going to be a little bit new for us. So this was nice for me because I was actually able to leverage my team's experience with paper prototyping and we didn't waste a lot of time trying to figure out how we were going to jump into creating something and begin testing right away. So the paper prototyping had the potential in really helping us address all three of our key challenges. So we were able to, potentially, we'd be able to start allowing to testing to start immediately. Um, it didn't demand a lot of resources, and it was fairly inexpensive to create something that few players could interact with. And based on the intention of the game and the experience of interacting with clues, the paper prototype would allow us to be ecological um, and match many of the aspects that we had planned in the end game design. So we decided to create our first prototype, and we knew we wanted to keep our, the goals of the test fairly straightforward. Mostly we just wanted to assess, do players actually understand the mystery? This was where we wanted to start off as first piece so that we could progress and figure out how we wanted to move forward. So we created the first prototype, which was an outline of the mystery, just in a Word document. Nothing particularly visually striking, but we had it contained all of the different clues that players would need to solve the mystery, just written out. So we had limited pictures. It was pretty quick and easy for us to kind of have them type up what the mystery looked like in the document. So we decided on this approach because it would immediately be able to allow us to address two of our three challenges. So we saved time by just writing out the descriptions of the clues rather than spending a lot of time actually creating a model or some sort of physical object. Um, we, and the, the, paper, the prototype was created in just a few days. So we went from conception to actually being able to have this first Word document rather quickly so we could validate which areas we were, players were struggling with. We also actually did make the decision to not be ecological here because we really wanted to jump into testing as soon as possible. Flipping through the Word document was not at all what we intended the end experience for the players to be, but we wanted to be able to jump into this first round, so we consciously made the decision to not focus on being ecological this first go around. So we created our prototype and just immediately jumped into testing. The procedure was fairly straightforward. Uh, players were given the Word document and just asked to review the clues. They, once they were done reviewing the clues, they had eight pages, which had each had a single question written on them, and they could answer the questions throughout the mystery while flipping back and forth and solving the mystery. We did actually ask players to think aloud while they were doing this process. 
Um, so telling us kind of what they were thinking about things, how they were understanding or misunderstanding certain items. And after the play session, we just conducted a, a short interview where we mostly asked kind of asked them to describe key plot points in the mystery so we could kind of gauge how they were able to piece the different pieces together. And we did this with a convenient sample of people, just some people around us that we knew would be able to come in and spend an hour or so kind of going through this game with us. It was all very quick. So we sat down after a couple of rounds of this with many different people. And we just wanted to be able to see, can we get the barometer of where we are now? So we had our quick test. Let's reflect on some of the game findings that we found. So our top question, uh, how well do players understand the mystery? This is what we really wanted to look at this first go around. So we weren't spending a lot of time really focusing on much else. So we sat and we looked at the data. So how well are they understanding it? Turns out they don't. <laughs> So uh, we had to kind of sit down and think about it and think, all right, well, why don't they understand? And it turns out we actually can't really answer that question either. Um, some understood some aspects and were able to describe them just fine, while others had absolutely no idea what was going on, couldn't put pieces together, just had no general sense of what the mystery was. Um, so we may have achieved our goal in creating the Dark Souls of Sherlock Holmes <laughs> Mystery Games. Um, but we weren't quite as happy with this as we thought we were going to be. So we still wanted players to be able to understand the key information. And that was something that was missing at this point. So we didn't understand why players were having difficulty. So let's explore a little bit kind of why we think they didn't understand. So this is our, pro this is our first prototype, all six pages of clues. So to kind of get an idea of what our problem could be, we decided to step back and kind of lay everything out in front of us and think, okay, what's happening here? Question one of the, of the, of the mystery, who's been murdered? Okay, I don't expect you to be able to read this because I know it's extremely tiny. <laughs> but our, our keen-eyed players would immediately be able to go to the obituaries page. There's five names there, so that's probably a good place to look at maybe who has been murdered. So, but in order to know for certain, and be able to know how you know who has been murdered, you need to review all 20 other clues. All of these clues containing multiple pieces of information. Overwhelmed yet? <laughs> so we began to suspect that the way in which the information is presented on the Word document uh, maybe may be one of the problematic aspects. Uh, but we really couldn't say for sure if this was the problem, but we weren't really happy with the, the way that players were not able to identify key pieces of information. So I wanted to reflect, we reflected on the game findings, and now I wanted to reflect on my own kind of methods of how we decided to run the test. So thinking about what I have learned kind of from this process, based on observations of players, uh, I recognized that one of our primary issues was it was extremely hard to know which clues players were actually interacting with at a given time. So they're reading through the Word document and they're reading through and they're really focusing. It's hard for me to know kind of which piece of the game they're actually interacting with. So this became problematic for us because it was really difficult to identify a single point of confusion. So when the mystery logic wasn't understood, it was difficult for us to know. Additionally, it was difficult for the player to be able to go back and actually point that out to us. They were constantly flipping back and forth through pages and it just wasn't, things weren't visually striking and it made it really challenging. So second, we had not really anticipated how to gain insights about how well players were understanding the clues in real time. Uh, we'd used think, a lot, think Aloud a lot in the past, but we hadn't really thought how this might not be viable for this type of game. So knowing we wanted to create an experience that was focused largely kind of on this internal reasoning and deductive chains, um, we should have anticipated that this heavy internal processing could have been a little bit difficult for people to kind of dual task. They're reading a lot of information, they're trying to answer questions, and I'm asking them to think aloud. Additionally, this whole experience was really difficult for me to judge when to interrupt players to kind of get more information because they were consistently kind of reading and flipping and it was hard for me to know when there was kind of a natural pause that I could kind of interject and ask some follow-up questions. 
So taking kind of what we had learned about our game findings with the actual way that the prototype was set up, as well as what we'd seen with the methods maybe not working as we had hoped, um, we immediately jumped into adjusting our prototype and the methods for our second phase of testing. So our first objective is, uh, you know, we didn't really have any way in knowing which clues players were interacting with, and we felt like this could be something that we could solve fairly pretty easy. So we wanted to alter the clues into something that we knew we could know better which they were actually interacting with. So our solution, quick photoshopped assets of clues we could cut out of pieces of paper and present out in front of the, in front of the player. They're much more visually distinct from one another. We still have all the same information. They're just a little bit more easy for you to visually recognize. Additionally, this decision was highly motivated by the actual end game design goal of having players standing at a desk, interacting with clues that are all kind of laid out in front of them. So it made a lot of ecological sense for us to transition away from the Word document into these kind of individual clues. My primary goal here was that we really wanted to see, can we tap this kind of physical interaction of how players are physically manipulating the clues throughout the game to get a better idea of kind of the cognitive process of how they're understanding the mystery. So our second objective is we needed to be able to evaluate whether players were actually understanding the clues. And to do this, I wanted to rethink my role as the moderator. After our team was having an internal discussion, kind of planning out later phases of the game, uh, there was something that really stuck out for me, and it was the fact that we had a key NPC player that was planned, a uh, key NPC that was in the game, that was going to be interacting with the player and providing different information and guiding them through the game. So this led me to think, you know, can I leverage this somehow in my test to see if I can actually bring that in and rethink my role? So after some research, I landed on the Wizard of Oz method. So this is a famous method used in traditional user research for websites and kind of software prototyping, which it allows the moderator to act like the back end of a system, showing to participants on the front end the results of their actions. So I decided to adapt the original Wizard of Oz method, which traditionally hides the moderator from the player but instead, I would be letting them know that I'm going to be sitting in their session and actually interacting with them throughout. So we had Watson, our NPC, and so I was going to be playing as Watson in the game with the player. The goal here was that we really wanted to be able to encourage more active conversation with the player and make it a little bit more natural for them to actually interact with me as we were moving through the game. So I was going to be able to provide different question prompts for them, as well as feedback on their responses, acting like the system would behave in the game. So in preparation for this next phase of testing, which had only been about two weeks after we finished phase one, we had adjusted our paper prototype, and we added the Wizard of Oz method and decided to see, OK, let's move into the next phase of testing and see what we can get. So when we look at our three initial challenges, uh, these two subtle changes were allowed us to really address all three. So in only a few days since our previous prototype, we've completely reworked how players are actually interacting with the game. We were also able, able to iterate fairly quickly because conceptually all of this information had already been created. We didn't change conceptually the game, we just present, changed the way that it was actually presented to them. And unlike in our first test, we were, much, we were able to be much more ecological in that we had the NPC in the game that was going to be much more in line with how the players would actually be experiencing it rather than just reading through the Word document. So once I landed on the Wizard of Oz, uh, I knew we needed to take some time to plan just how these sessions would run, um, as there was two significant concerns for me. And if you've caught some keywords that I mentioned, you probably have these concerns as well. <laughs> so first, uh, we need to address the very high potential uh, for bias. So this was a huge concern for me, knowing that I was going to be sitting in the game with the player and actually interacting with them and guiding them almost through their session. So there was high potential for me actually biasing this, the different sessions. And since I was going to be playing as Watson, as well as the moderator and the note taker, 
we need to take into consideration how that was actually going to look for me playing all three of these roles and how potentially we could kind of streamline and make this process a little bit more efficient for me. So to address my concerns, uh, we landed on creating a script for Watson. So this, this served really two purposes. So one, first and most importantly, this would allow me to just follow a script as I was interacting with the player. So I had key risk, I had question responses for them. If they requested feedback, I had set responses based on the clues they were kind of presenting for me. And I also wrote down just a variety of kind of canned responses of, you know, go, please go back and check the clues and we'll revisit this question just so that everything that I could possibly be interacting with the player was already completely scripted out. The second purpose was this was really helpful for our design team. So they knew that Watson was gonna play a key role and that he was gonna be interacting with players, but we hadn't really thought about how that script was actually going to look and what information players actually needed to be able to progress. So we decided to just take the first kind of step at looking at, okay, how much information do they need before we're eliminating kind of some of these misunderstanding issues and that we're not guiding them too much. So when it came to testing, we cut out all of our clues and put them on the desk and we brought players in and we seated them there and I briefed them on my role. So I would be interacting with them, providing question prompts, responses to their, to their answers, solutions, and that I would be interacting with them throughout. So the first phase is we just prompted the players to investigate the different clues in front of them. We didn't give them a lot of kind of limitations on how this would look. We wanted them to just kind of interact with this information. So I encouraged them to reposition, move them around, they could write on them, whatever they wanted to do. So once they were done investigating the clues, this is when we really moved into the solving phase of the mystery, when my active role became much more apparent. So I would provide a question prompt for them, and they would have to select three pieces of information to propose a solution to the question. And they were also asked to explain why they chose those pieces of evidence. The support of their, the, they believed supported their solution. So based on the responses that they gave me, I provided feedback, whether they provided an incorrect or, an inc or a correct response. Correct solutions moved on to the next question until we completed the eight questions of the mystery. Once they completed, short interview, similar to our same procedure, where we sat and asked them just a few questions and asked them how they understood key plot points of the mystery. So, do they understand now? <laughs> we made some reworks to the way that we were presenting the information and we changed some of our methods. So now we wanted to see, okay, conceptually the game has remained the same. It's just the way that we're actually kind of running this information with them is what's changed. So can we say that they understand now? So one of the key takeaways from phase one was that the prototype was really making it difficult to know which clues players were interacting with at any given time. So this is when we moved to the physical clues. So by creating these physical clues, I was really able to get more insights into actually how the cognitive process was going, watching them as they were manipulating the clues throughout the session. So this was important because we were able to see which clues players were using during certain questions, as well as we could see on from the video that we were taking as well as my observation, which clues players were not interacting with for a key questions. So we could kind of begin to anticipate when issues did arise, we could kind of see maybe where those things were coming from. So one of our second takeaways from the first prototype was really relying on Think Aloud uh, during the session with players was really not a viable way in getting meaningful insights into their misunderstandings. And with so many connections, with all of the clues really linking together in a lot of really unique and interesting ways, we really wanted to ensure that players were understanding the base core information that would help them advance through the mystery. The solution here was my, the, med, the modified Wizard of Oz method. So this allowed me to capture when there were conflicts um, in the understanding. Typically this resulted in players presenting the correct clue, but having an incorrect answer. So this was something that, these mis this specific type of misunderstanding was not something we were able to capture with the way we ran our first test. So the method really allowed us to identify that we had one clue in particular that was causing a lot of misunderstanding and confusion for our players. 
which was the bank ledger. So this had multiple vital connections that players would need to reference at different times throughout the mystery. So at the point at which the misunderstanding became apparent is when players needed to connect the murder suspect to the murder victim. And this was the key piece of information that players needed to find. So this is a ledger entry that actually connects the victim to the suspect. But so we can find this and we know that this links these two people, but we need to corroborate this information and be able to provide two other pieces of information because we have to provide three pieces of evidence to propose a solution. Our primary issue with this clue, a seemingly simple font choice. <laughs> so our main character here is Ira Collins and players frequently misunderstood this as being a T which completely they believed was an entirely new character in the mystery, but they could not find any other information for this T. Collins. So they wrote off this connection. We also had a lot of other things that we were able to realize from this one clue based on how players were interacting with it. One thing that was not immediately obvious for us was that our players didn't actually recognize the difference between credits and debits. <laughs> Not that we would have anticipated this, but we were able to see that they were misunderstanding who was paying who and who was purchasing these items. This was very con oddly confusing, but we were able to see that in the way that they were interacting and explaining how they were using the clues to solve the questions. Additionally, there was some more subtle things like the difference between what tending and groundskeeping was. Our players were very unsure, kind of, are these the same thing? I know that Ira is a groundskeeper, but these ledger entries all say that he's getting paid, if they did understand that he was getting paid, that it was for tending. So they were missing this. And this caused a lot of further issues when they weren't able to see kind of what these connections with all of the characters were through this one clue. Lastly, clear down here at the bottom, Players were really not understanding the currency amounts. So our US players did not really understand what the difference between pounds and shillings and pence are. So a 120 pound gift that this person received in the game was completely written off because they didn't actually understand how significant 120 pounds was in comparison to the other amounts that were on the ledger. We were able to really kind of diagnose and see a lot of these things through the way we were able to, I was able to interact with the player and ask them as they were explaining why they were using this piece of, these pieces of information. So during phase two of testing, we implemented two new strategies. So we modified the way that the prototype was actually presented to the player, and we brought in the Wizard of Oz method to be able to kind of interact with players throughout their session. So the physical clues ended up being really helpful in seeing which players, which clues players were interacting with at any given time. This was especially important when players were playing silently. There was a lot of time where players were internally processing a lot of this information, but I could see based on the question they were trying to answer, which clues they were going to and interacting with. This was extremely helpful to see if they weren't selecting a key clue, if they spent a lot of time on a question, we could start to diagnose that maybe they hadn't actually looked at this other piece of information. And the Wizard of Oz method really allowed us to find why the players were making these incorrect deductions. So we had a lot of issues with the first prototype, but we couldn't actually nail down when and why some of these things were happening because we didn't have the same interaction that we had that the Wizard of Oz method really allowed us to bring. So all this really allowed me to get a lot more actionable information back from my team so that we could really address the key areas of unintended confusion that needed to be addressed, because that's what we wanted. We knew there was going to be some confusion in that it was a mystery game, and that was kind of the intention, but we wanted to address those misunderstandings that were causing players to go completely down the wrong path and not being able to recover. So we covered all of our initial challenges kind of multiple times when we were looking at these different methods, but we still haven't touched on one thing, the co-op aspect of the game. We knew this was something that we wanted to employ in future episodes, so we wondered what would be different in a situation if players were playing the same mystery, but in a group. 
So we have a lot of information on kind of the individual clue understanding because we focus a lot on the single player sessions, which they're interacting with the clues at a much more micro level. But beyond that, we were interested if, can we get more information in how groups are actually understanding the mystery and how that actually might differ from what our single player situation is looking like? Additionally, this made a lot of sense for us because it was something that was, the co-op aspect was something that was planned for us in later design. And we didn't have to alter our method in any way. We had something that was working with the single player, so we wanted to see if we could make it work and what would happen for our multiplayers. It was also extremely inexpensive because we had access to groups that we could do this testing with. And we didn't actually have to change the prototype or anything at all. So for the test, we just took what we had and we had access to a convenient sample of people, which was nice because we were able to break them up into groups of four fairly easily. We laid out the clues on the table just as we had with the single player session and allowed them to really just pace through solving the mystery and investigating the clues. I didn't really have a lot of expectations for what the sessions would bring. It was just something more we were really interested to see kind of how much more difficult is it to design a mystery for groups. So we interestingly had two kind of fascinating findings that were helpful for us. So one, the group sessions had a really interesting dynamic of spontaneous think aloud, which we hadn't seen as much with our single player sessions. So we didn't have to rely on using, we didn't have to rely on using a lot of the prompts that I had with the single players because they were interacting with themselves a little bit more naturally. When confusion or different blockers came up, they immediately just stopped and discussed it, am discussed it amongst themselves without having me to prompt what was going on. They also had different solving strategies. So instead of in our single player sessions when the player had all of the clues laid out, our four players just kind of naturally divided the clues amongst themselves and kind of became owners of very few clues so that they knew they would have to work together, knowing they had three pieces of information that they had to present. When the question was given to them, they spent a lot of time kind of discussing as a group which clue they felt was appropriate. So the multiplayer sessions ended up being really valuable for us. The single player, we were able to get more understanding of an individual clue. So ensuring information was being understood and parsed as intended at a much more micro level. Where with the multiplayer sessions, we were able to see kind of more actively how players were connecting all of the different clues together in the bigger picture because they were consistently stepping back and explaining them clues, explaining the clues to, to each other. So we've never tested a mystery game before, and we ran a bunch of different testing. <laughs> so what did we learn? So we ran three different phases of testing in just under three months. And with the goal, we wanted to address all three of our initial challenges as frequently as possible. So we were able to start testing right away because we started with the paper prototyping. So this was only a handful of days after the concept really came together. We were also able to iterate fairly quickly and several times because we had something that was just on paper and it was we could just throw it away when it didn't work and create a new one fairly easily. And we were able to be ecological in the way that our tests and our methods were running with our players so we could get a better idea of kind of the expectations of how this end experience that we had planned could potentially work for the players. So final takeaways. What did we take away from all this and how did it really impact our future testing on other episodes that we created? So as we discussed, the paper prototyping really helped us jump into testing right away. And this was important because it helped the team really see that we could get valuable insights even when we had something that was pretty early, pretty early on. More interestingly for us, the modified Wizard of Oz method, which we hadn't used before, was fairly successful and we really felt that this helped being able to identify the areas of unintended confusion, which is something that I was concerned about from the very beginning. It also helped alleviate our issue with the think aloud. So this was a problem we were having, but we were able to kind of engage in more active conversation with the players. The downside to the modified Wizard of Oz is that it was extremely taxing for me to play all three roles. So I was playing the wizard, the moderator, and the note taker. 
So I would highly recommend not doing all three if you have to do this. <laughs> so get a note taker. It's really, it's immensely helpful. And lastly, we had this mix of single player and multiplayer sessions. So we were able to get a better idea, not only how players were understanding the individual pieces, but also an interesting perspective on how they were understanding the bigger picture of the mystery. So in retrospect, I probably would have done the multiplayer sessions first because we were able to get insights on the bigger picture really early and some interesting insights into how players were understanding the, the pieces of information. But it was really important that even on our future multiplayer game session of episodes, we still ran single player sessions because we were able to see how players were understanding the individual pieces and being able to really get a good gauge on the difficulty and the timing of how players were working through. I'm getting low on time, so that is all I have for you. <laughs> Hello? Does it work? Okay, does okay. it work? Uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah. I have a question. The, um, this particular modified method really struck me as a very similar to uh, Game Master in like D&D &D campaign. And I'm yes. curious, uh, what are your thoughts about doing this early but having a trained DM uh, and modify the loop a little bit so that the player can actually actively ask questions about the clues if they do not understand, mm -hmm. and researcher being an observer and taking a note in that way. So that was something that was actually really helpful for us, is when we did have misunderstandings for clues and all of the responses in my script didn't cover kind of what they were looking at, I was able to note that so that when we moved into the next phase of testing, we were able to address that and include information on the clue if that was an unintended area of confusion that we didn't want the players to have. So uh, as far as having this kind of D&D &D kind of game master role, this was kind of something that was really inspired us to do that. Uh, my biggest concern was the bias and we just really wanted to ensure that we were covering all of our bases and we weren't biasing the session. So that was just the one thing that we decided to have it completely scripted as much as possible. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for a Hi. very interesting uh, and uh, refreshing talk, actually. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I know, that, uh, I know that you work at Ubisoft now. I do. And forgive me if this is a strange question, but uh, it seems to me that, well, I'm curious, because uh, Ubisoft, I've also worked there before, has a really rich set of heuristics uh, for gaming user research, and mm -hmm. so I'm curious if, you, uh, sort of knowing what you know now, if you went back and did the same research, uh, if there's anything from the sort of usability, learnability heuristics from Ubisoft specifically that we use, uh, and I, I guess I ask because um, this seems like almost a pure object lesson in minimum workload, like in mm -hmm. Ubisoft terms. So, uh, and then my second question is actually. Uh, as a lover of de detective fiction, like part of the pleasure of it is, is the hunch, right? Of like, I know this is important, mm -hmm. but I, or I think this is important, but I don't know why, and then either proving it or disproving it to yourself as yeah. you sort of read further. And I'm curious, and that often arises sort of spontaneously, either in the protagonist of the story or in the player mm -hmm. in the case of a game. So I'm curious uh, how you sort of manage that, or if that was part of uh, the the um, your role as a game master, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Lots of questions, thank you. Um, addressing the first question, I think for me, um, if we were to go back and kind of do it again, honestly, I'm fairly happy with how it turned out and I'd have to take a deeper look at the kind of Ubi the, what the heuristics you're referring to and seeing if we could alter that in any way. Um, but we wanted to keep it simple and straightforward and just get into it as soon as possible. So we just kind of jumped right in. So I would probably need to spend some more time thinking about it in the future. Uh, but with the kind of the second comment, which is interesting, is that we, the hunch thing was really helpful for us, is we really kind of, I wanted to explore what the players kind of had this hunch about, like, oh, we had, we ended up having one clue that we didn't realize was only used until the very last question. And we had, we actually didn't know that until players were like, I know that this clue is going to help me answer this question because it's the only one I haven't used. And we were just like, oh crap. 
we had we just we hadn't noticed that and so we were able to kind of explore that a little bit like okay well explain to me like why you think that clue is and like oh i haven't used it before so it was interesting to kind of build on that and probe them a little bit deeper when they did kind of have this idea of i understand that something's here but i'm not really sure so we wanted to kind of dig deeper and me being there allowed me to dig a little bit deeper with them Uh, thank you for the great talk. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question about note-taking affordances that the um, participants yeah. had. Were they given any highlighters or pieces of papers? And if so, do you think those would be useful as a proxy for their focus? Um, what yes. they jot down, what they like highlight, and would you be comfortable using that as a proxy? So, we did give them a paper and pen, and they could take notes. Um, that actually really inspired some of the kind of how we modified the clues to be able to make them be understood a little bit. We hadn't anticipated that we uh, had dates on all of the clues, and we hadn't really connected that players were just gonna make like a timeline. They just all immediately like drew a line and started like gathering all the clues and placing them in kind of an order. And that was really interesting for me as an observer to be able to see like, okay, oh, I see what they're doing. They're trying to kind of put all these pieces of information together and that helped us in future episodes in kind of giving these key little nuggets of fun information for players to look at. So not only was the notes helpful for the player because they were kind of taking note of base of information, uh, but they also really appreciated the fact when they did have this initial hunch and they wrote down something and they were able to point it out to me at the very end and be like, I knew it. I knew this person had involvement for something. So. It was helpful for them to be able to kind of work through that process, and we we wondered if maybe that would have helped in the first prototype if we had given them something. Um, but it is something that we've continued to do in all the other episodes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we are out of time. Sorry, but thank you so much. If you have any other questions, please just come find me.